Good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's session. This one is a very special one for everybody. And we have with us a very dear friend who has requested me not to give any formal introduction because puri dunya inko janti hai, inka naam Mihir Vats hai, aur ye bahut achhe kavi hain, bahut achhe historian hain, multitasking karte rehte hain, inki tasveere hum logon ko bahut pasand aati hai, right? So we have between us uh, today's speaker Mihir Vats and. I need to tell you the topic of today's uh, lecture, that is how to critically read fiction with special reference to Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. So, बहुत सारे बच्चे जो पागलों की तरह इंतजार कर रहे थे इस सेशन का योर वेट इज़ फाइनली ओवर एंड वी हैव बिटवीन आस मिहिर वाट्स हु लुक्स लाइक अ लाइक गजनी फिल्म्स आमिर खान राइट नाउ मिहिर वेलकम गुड इवनिंग and uh, i think we can uh, start with your session on how to critically read fiction without wasting any time over to you hello hi uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, varsha and uh, it's a pleasure to be amongst the students of guru nanak college again uh, so today's uh, lecture is going to be uh, more like a talk and uh, and i'm going to share with you my experiences of reading uh, wuthering heights uh, first as a student then as as a, just a layman reader and then uh, as someone who was given the task to uh, teach it at the university right so uh, before actually uh, getting into the book uh, let me just begin by uh, thanking the Uh, administration of the Guru Nanak College for inviting me again, and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm glad to be here with all of you. Uh, <clears throat> now, Wuthering Heights. Uh, Wuthering Heights was uh, published in 1847, right? It, it was published in, right in the middle of the Victorian period, as we know it. And uh, what we are going to uh, do in this uh, session is that we are going to take up Wuthering Heights as an example. Uh, in order to understand that, how do we actually read fiction critically? And uh, we understand that all of us here present here, uh, most of us uh, belong to a literature background, and many of you are students of literature. So my uh, purpose is for you to make uh, for uh, for you to understand to make you understand that how to uh, read critically. and uh, for this uh, session uh, i think i have done how to read critically uh, poetry with you and uh, for this session this is fiction uh, of course like with a poem you can uh, do a close reading of it and uh, and and you can cover the entire text uh, we won't be able to cover the entire uh, we won't be able to cover the entire text of uh, pudring heights in one session so what i have uh, done is that i have selected around five scenes from the book and i am assuming that if even if you haven't read the complete text then at least you are familiar with the story uh, you may have read some summary of it from the internet right so uh, but it would be okay it would be nice if you if you have read the text but even if you haven't then it's fine uh, <clears throat> now when when we when we read fiction and when we read anything right so the first thing that comes to our mind is that what is it about so when someone says that okay you must read this book and if someone said says that you must watch that movie and have you read this poem right so the very first thought that comes to our mind and perhaps one of the first questions that we ask is that what is it about right and that is where uh, we we come to understand the relevance of the plot right so the plot is actually the skeleton uh, the basic skeleton of any story any novel and when we are dealing with fiction then fiction is short story it is flash fiction it is a novel it is an epic saga whatever right so there has to be some some skeleton to the story right and traditionally a skeleton starts from somewhere and it has the middle and it ends somewhere else right so you have a beginning middle and end so if someone has to ask me that what is the plot of harry potter 
then I will say that uh, it is about a young wizard who goes to a wizarding school and, uh, and it is about his adventures there, right? So what I'm doing here is that I'm not actually revealing the story. I am revealing the premise. I'm revealing, I'm just giving you a kind of synopsis that what is happening, right? If someone asks me that what is, that what is Wuthering Heights about, then I'll say that uh, this is a tragic love story uh, which stretches across three generations, right? And that will be, uh, will be the foundation on which the story will later be constructed. And the, sto the story will not be constructed by the author because they have already written it. The story will be constructed by you, right? So when we read a work of fiction, and when we read as as practicing readers, right? We read as readers who are also participating in the process. So we are not just passive receptor of what we are reading, but we are also thinking alongside the process of reading. And when we are thinking while reading, then we also participate in creating meanings. Now. All of you know that a word can have multiple meanings and even more connotations, right? So when I read a specific word, then what happens is that I choose from the set of multiple meanings that are available to me. And I choose the specific meaning because I resonate with something, right? I resonate with something in the text. When I resonate with something in the text, I choose to believe in one meaning of some specific word. And if you extend it, then I choose to believe in certain specific meanings of certain combination of words, right? Now, what, what is clear here is that when we do this, then we also become writers. Then we are no longer just receiving the information that is given to us. While reading a text, we also read ourselves. So when someone says that I really like this book, when someone says that I did not like this book, or anything, right? Or if someone gives you a mixed review, right? I resonated with this work, I did not resonate with this work, right? So when we read anything, what happens is that we identify we identify either with the protagonist, in some cases, either with the villain, uh, in some cases, with a particular situation, in some cases, with certain action. Maybe the protagonist is doing something that we also have done. And in that moment of reading, we tend to view it that, yes, this is something that I have also done. This is something that they are also doing. So I can understand what is happening with them. Similarly, if someone in a story is pining for their lover, and if you have also pined for your lover, then you will understand that pining, right? If someone in a story uh, is running away from some responsibilities, and all of us have at one point or the other run away from certain responsibilities, uh, then we will identify with that. When we identify with these things, these are how we connect with the text, right, emotionally. And when we connect with the text, not only are we connecting with what the writer has given to us, we are connecting also with ourselves, right? So fiction, to be particular, even though it is, it is not real in that sense, but it has its own reality, right? It is not real in the sense of being a journalistic account. It is not real in the sense of being a diary entry. But fiction has its own reality. And that reality sometimes corresponds with us. Now, when we read fiction, and when we decide what to associate ourselves with, what parts we should resonate with, what parts we are going to identify with, then we create our own skeleton. So previously, I said that it was a plot is a skeleton of the story. But now we understand that the skeleton can also change. So if someone asks me, 
uh, who is now a teacher of literature, that what is Wuthering Heights about, then I may tell them that Wuthering Heights is about love, tragedy, and re redemption. If someone asks me, uh, who was previously a student of literature in Delhi, then I may have told that person that it is simply a love story which goes through ups and downs, right? What I'm doing here is that every time I am reading the book, I am developing my own understanding of what the bare minimum is, that what is the crux of the novel. And I've chosen Wuthering Heights precisely because it is a novel which, which, which even if you try to summarize it, even if you try to reduce it to a bare minimum skeleton, it has something in it which will always escape. It, is some, it has something in it which will always be in excess, right? Now, uh, I'm not going to summarize the novel, but I'm just going to uh, give you uh, a brief uh, overview, not in the sense of summary, but just in the sense of a rambling talk, okay? So what is this novel about? This novel is about two houses, like the title says Wuthering Heights. So that is one house, right? And then there is another house called Thrush Cross Grant, right? These two houses are separated by this vast, vast landscape of moor, right? And what is a moor? Moor is a desolate landscape. No tree grows on a moor, right? It's just maybe just weeds, grass, it is boggy, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is, uh, it is very, uh, it is something that will bore you if you walk along it uh, for a long time, because it is so monotonous. And it just, it is an undulating stretch of land with very little vegetation. And even if there is vegetation, then it is not much to look upon. Right? So <clears throat> when when you're walking across these moors, Right, and these moors are what stand between Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grant. So we have these two homes, and between these two homes, this desolate patch of land. And we have our first narrator, which is Mr. Lockwood, right? And we have our first narrator who has come from the city, perhaps from London, and he has come from the city, and he has come from the city looking for isolation, according to his own admittance, that he has come from the city to spend some time in seclusion. And he has rented the property of Thrush Cross Grange from one very mysterious Mr. Heathcliff, right, who lives in Wuthering Heights. And he goes to visit Heathcliff and he finds Heathcliff very like I said, mysterious and very queer and very uh, very cold also. Uh, but uh, but as they say, like uh, uh, Lockwood ends up uh, in despite despite understanding that Heathcliff is not someone that he has or Heathcliff does not behave in the way that uh, people usually behave towards their tenants. Uh, he he desperately wants to have a good impression on Heathcliff, and he desperately wants to uh, kind of evoke a sense of friendship from him, uh, which of course, how it turns out, we'll see later. <clears throat> now, what I'm trying to ask is that, is Wuthering Heights a novel about two homes, right? That is one thing to consider. Now, in Wuthering Heights, uh, when we go into the flashback, which is narrated by the second narrator, which is Mrs. Dean, right? And we realize that there are two families. So previously there were two homes, now there are two families. The first family is the Earnshaw family who lives in Wuthering Heights. The second family is that of the Lintons, right? And who live at Thrush Cross Grange, right? And as you will progress through the book, you will see that you don't have other people around. You have Dr. Kenneth and you have the attorney, uh, Mr. Green. And other than that, all the characters in the book belong to one of these two houses, 
right? So there are no major characters who come from outside of the house, apart from Mr. Lockwood, who is our narrator, right? So the entire book follows around the lives of the people who live in these two homes, right? So is the book then the life and the story of these two families, right? That is something to consider again. Now, at the uh, at Wuthering Heights, we have the Earnshaw family, and there is and there is uh, Father Earnshaw, there is the Mother Earnshaw, and there is there are the kids, the two kids, right? Uh, there is Hindley, the son, and Catherine, the daughter. Now. When Mr. Earnshaw, the father, he had to go uh, out for some work and he asked that, what would you like to have? Then Catherine Earnshaw said that, please, please bring uh, a whip for me. Now we know that whip is an instrument of control, right? So you use a whip to tame a horse or to make a horse follow your instruction. The whip unfortunately gets broken and what Catherine gets in return is Heathcliff, this young boy, invalid boy, who has no father, who has no mother, who is not white. He, he does not have blonde hair or blue eyes. He has black hair and black eyes, right? And he is clearly an other to the self that is created in the Wuthering Heights, the Victorian self, right? So he is very different. And there is a replacement that is which is happening immediately in in the first uh, within the first three chapters, is that instead of a whip, Catherine is getting one human being, right? So if Catherine wanted to control, then she has someone to control now. So earlier Catherine wanted an instrument of control. Now she has a full human being at her disposal. Right now, so is this a story about control and conflict at how it plays out? As the novel progresses, we see that the kids grow up, all the three kids, Hindley, Catherine, Heathcliff, right? All the three kids grow up. And then what happens is that uh, one fine day, Heathcliff and Catherine, they just wander off to Thrush Cross Grange, where they meet the Lintons. And the Lintons have two kids, Edgar and Isabella. And Catherine, because she belongs to uh, this uh, landed gentry, right? She is allowed admittance to Thrush Cross Grange. Meanwhile, Heathcliff, who is who is clearly uh, of who is clearly considered to be inferior to Catherine, who is clearly considered as someone equivalent to the servant class, Heathcliff is not allowed entry to Thrushcross Grange, right? And Heathcliff is forced to return in the night. So, and later we see that Heathcliff comes back fully grown man as a revenge-seeking person. And by his uh, plottings and by his manners, by his uh, devious schemes, he not only takes control of Wuthering Heights, but he also takes control of Thrush Cross Grange, where he was once refused entry, right? So is this a story of a man's journey from rags to riches, right? Then we have Catherine Earnshaw. Right, our heroine. And Catherine Earnshaw is someone who has been described with one adjective, and that is wild. Right? And it is very easy for us to romanticize wildness that, yeah, she is a wild figure, she cannot be restrained. But the thing is, when we are talking about wildness, and if wildness is, is the quality of being, uh, of, of is the quality of of someone who is not domesticated, then we see that at the time of Mr. Earnshaw, Catherine's father's death, right? When Catherine is speaking with Mr. Earnshaw and Mr. Earnshaw is in his chair, 
very close to dying, the last words that Mr. Earnshaw heard from Catherine is that, why can't you be a good man, father? Right? Even though Catherine did not mean it, even though Catherine was only saying this in order to annoy him, because he had previously asked Catherine that, why can't you be a good girl? And Catherine had retorted that, why can't you be a good father? And that were the last words that the father heard from a daughter, right? And then come to uh, around 20 chapters later, we see the daughter of Catherine Earnshaw, who is also called Catherine. And daughter of Catherine Earnshaw, who is called Catherine Heathcliff now. Catherine Heathcliff <coughs> runs from Wuthering Heights, where she had been kidnapped. And Catherine Heathcliff runs from Wuthering Heights and runs towards her father. And meanwhile, the father is dying, right? And runs towards her father just in order for the father to see her, right? And who is the father of Catherine Heathcliff? It's Edgar Linton, the husband of Catherine Earnshaw, right? It's a complicated family. Uh, the tree, right? But we see a difference here. We see a difference in the way senior Catherine, Catherine Earnshaw treated her father, which was full of childlike playfulness, not minding what she was saying to her father. And, and contrast it with the way Catherine Earnshaw's daughter, Catherine Heathcliff, runs towards her father to be with him at his last moment, right? So then is this a story of the two daughters, Catherine Earnshaw or Catherine Linton and Catherine Heathcliff, right? So we can go on and on just trying to condense the story into one plot, right? And depending on how one reads it, the plot will also differ. Now, when we read, now we, we know that Victor, uh, Wuthering Heights is a Victorian novel, right? And we know that people, uh, critics have said it, that it is also a Gothic novel. We know that it has elements of love story within it. We know that it has elements of tragedy within it. Now, all of these things operate under certain archetypes. When I what is archetype? Archetype is the larger construction of a story and, and something that, that you will see repeating in, in, in stories after stories after stories. So take, for example, that if, if you have to uh, look at any Bollywood masala movie, then what you'll see is that there's a hero, there's a heroine, they meet, they fall in love, then there is someone who comes in between, whether it is the father, whether it is uh, the situation, whether it is the hero's poverty or the heroine's uh, religion, something, some conflict is thrown into uh, their relationship. And then that conflict has to be resolved. And then you get to your happily ever after, right? Similarly, in novel and fiction also, what we see is that there are certain archetypes. When we deal with a love story, uh, we have a hero and a heroine, and they have to overcome certain obstacles in order to meet in the end, right? Then when we come to Gothic fiction, uh, one of the most prominent tropes of Gothic fiction is, is, is women screaming in dungeons, right? Uh, doors shattering and lightning happening outside and thund it's thundering in the sky, right? And, and there are shrieking noises and there are like fainting women uh, who needs who need to be you know like rescued from from uh, from uh, heroic heroes what what happens in Wuthering Heights is that uh, there is a ghost a ghost does come and the ghost comes in in, in I think uh, third or fourth chapter only and but who is shrieking? It's not the, it's not a woman who is shrieking, right? It is, it is a man who is shrieking. It is Lockwood, right? Who is being terrified? It is Lockwood who is terrified. It is not your typical 
hapless damsel who is terrified of the ghost right and this is where we see that emily bronte is is subverting the archetype that no no there will be a ghost there will be gothic elements but i am not going to make a heroine suffer through the terror i am going to make a hero or a male figure suffer through it right now as if we consider that wuthering heights is a love story and if uh, archetypically if if a love story has to end hap- in a happily ever after fashion after overcoming the obstacle and if we consider that wuthering heights is a love story of catherine and heathcliff then we don't see that happening because catherine dies catherine dies in the middle of the novel and heathcliff goes on to live and heathcliff uh, not only exacts revenge uh, upon what was done wrong to him but he uh, he he makes sure that the descendants of catherine uh, catherine's own daughter uh, she is treated very poorly by heathcliff and 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 sometimes if you will uh, if you read the novel uh, you will understand that heathcliff as the daughter of catherine uh, so there are two catherines right so there's senior catherine the daughter of catherine so let's call the daughter of catherine cathy so cathy was imprisoned almost held hostage by heathcliff at wuthering heights so that cathy could marry heathcliff's son who is lenton heathcliff right so what kind of love is this is is this the kind of love that we think about when we think of a love story that the your lover is dead and instead of you being nice towards your lover's daughter you are being mean towards her and you are terrorizing her you are keeping her hostage and 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 if we think of uh, of of love stories being something like okay, okay once we have overcome a conflict then everything will be sorted afterwards then it doesn't happen this way in wuthering heights so lots and lots of archetypes which existed in the victorian times which uh, regarding your gothic novel regarding say for example even tragedy i mean uh, the archetype of tragedy is that you have to have a noble man who is falling from the graces and 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 then you are supposed to feel pity and terror and then uh, that man is going to die and i don't think we feel pity and terror for heathcliff by the time we finish the book but to be very honest i felt very relieved that he is finally dead because by the time the book comes to an end he has done many many devious deeds uh, and and after a while it becomes very taxing to actually see heathcliff going around with his plotting and scheming and and just terrorizing people and after a while you feel ki, okay now stop it are you even a human being are you even a man or are you just a devil incarnate and even though there there are people who in the book who just call heathcliff a devil but as readers we are always uh, waiting for something to change something to change something for heathcliff to just break away from that devilish attitude and to do something good for once right and that happens very much later in the novel in near the very end and <clears throat> and 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 that and when we talk about love stories and when we talk about that archetype that okay two people meeting then their conflict and then conflict gets resolved and they are meeting again we don't see this archetype being fulfilled what actually happens is that heathcliff and catherine's love story does not get realized and yes there is a suggestion a suggestion that uh, in in death they are together i mean it's a very nice way of uh, articulating uh, a loss of love which you couldn't pursue when you were alive that okay we will be together in death so they are symbolically together in death we don't know the dead don't speak so we can't uh, ask the ghosts of catherine and 
Heathcliff that whether you are together or not. But as long as they lived, they were not together, right? So there were conflicts that they uh, they braved through, but they did not come to uh, that conflict that did not uh, come to a resolution, and they were not happily uh, reunited, right? What happened instead was that Catherine's daughter and 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 Hindley's uh, Catherine's brother, Hindley's son, who was raised by Heathcliff, right, in his fashion. So Hindley's son, Hareton Earnshaw, who, who was raised by Heathcliff to become as much as a brute as Heathcliff is, as much as a rugged person as Heathcliff is, he and Cathy, they begin to fall in love with each other. Right? And this happens near the very end of the novel. So yes, there is some redemption. There is some redemption to love. So is the story about love and redemption? There are many things that Wuthering Heights throws, throws at you, right? And, and it makes you think that what is actually happening? The, the first time when Wuthering Heights was released in 1847, uh, the initial uh, reviews were, were full of shock and horror. I mean, people, people couldn't digest that a story like this could be written because they had not seen anything like this before. Like you have ghost also, you have a hero and your heroine, they are doing mischievous deeds to each other. And they say that they are in love with each other, but they behave like uh, teenagers on steroids, either always complaining, always fighting. Uh, nothing, nothing seems like uh, the quality of love, which we usually uh, uh, which we usually see in, in, in stories or movies and songs, right? And this makes our understanding of the novel very problematic, right? And in a positive way, problematic, not in a negative way, but in a positive way. Uh, what I have decided to do is that I, I have uh, picked out five passages, basically five chapters, right? Which I would like to go through, uh, and uh, through which uh, we will see that what kind of love exists between Catherine and Heathcliff? Uh, who, who, how, how the narrative shifts from one narrator to the other, uh, and uh, to what extent uh, the story could have shocked the readers, right? So the very first chapter that I'm going to read from is chapter first, right? the very uh, beginning of the novel. Right? Uh, we see that who, who initiates the novel. The, the novel is initiated by Lockwood, right? And Lockwood says that I have just returned from a visit to my landlord, the solitary neighbor that I shall be troubled. It's certainly a beautiful country. And a few lines down, he says that a perfect misanthropist heaven and Mr. Heath and I are such a suitable pair to divide the desolation between us. Someone who wants someone who wants to be left alone, right? This is not of you. And as a second, someone who who is wistful about having a company. Right? So I want to be left alone, but I want to be alone with one some a few people with, uh, with whom I can pass the time. Okay? And then in the next line is that he little and how my heart warmed towards him when I beheld his black eyes withdraw so suspiciously under their brows as I rode up, and when his fingers sheltered themselves with jealous resolution, still further in his waistcoat as I announced my name. Usually what this thing will evoke is, is a feeling of disinterest, right? That when you go to some someone and they look at you suspiciously, they don't look you in the eye, get you like some, there's something wrong about you. And they they feel they seem to you very physically reserved too. Would your heart warm towards them? I don't think so. I mean I, I personally will be very, uh, very annoyed by that kind of behavior. That hey, I, I'm, I'm, I come to you 
with good intentions and you are looking at me as if I'm a thief and uh, you're looking at me as if you don't believe in me. And that is not something which will warm my heart towards that person. It will make my heart grow colder towards that person. So the very first uh, scene that we see is, is telling us that Lockwood uh, may, may, may be either too eager in order to cultivate friendship with this Heathcliff, or maybe he he suffers from a very bad decision making quality that he cannot be good or or, or he cannot be a good uh, judge of character, right? And we see that Lockwood is is a very he he comes across as a self deprecating person, but even in his self deprecation, he does manage to make things about himself, right? So. He talks about uh, how uh, he met this young girl uh, whom he was attracted to at one point of time. And, uh, and he used to give her long look and uh, he used to look towards her finally. And then one day when the girl returned the same loving look towards him, then what happened? Then Lockwood lost all trust. And and the girl, the poor girl, she thought that Lockwood was interested in him. And therefore, she returned the book of love. And when Lockwood stopped giving her attention, then she got confused regarding her own feelings. Like, what the hell am I feeling? Like, whether I was imagining everything, whether whatever I was thinking was correct, whatever I was thinking was wrong, am I a fool? Is something wrong with me? So she starts to think all of these things. And then what happens that it takes a toll on her and she thinks that he's going crazy. Lockwood is not giving her attention, even though he initiated the entire process. And then she leaves with her mother, right? And then she says that uh, it's, my, it's my ill fate. Like it is, I am cursed not to have love, right? So, in, in in his acknowledgement that what he has done wrong or where he has failed, Doc comes across as a person who who wants to project that he is, he is important, who wants to project that uh, he has feelings, still important, right? And we see that he is very eager. He's very eager to make friendship with Heathcliff. I don't know why. If someone comes to enjoy solitude, why would you go around making friendships with people, right? So there is some contradiction in, in how Lockwood be, behaves, right? And then, and then he describes uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Heathcliff, and then he describes uh, Woodring Heights. And this passage is very important, where he actually uh, gives you the meaning of Wuthering Heights. That Wuthering Heights is the name of Mr. Heathcliff's dwelling, Wuthering being significant provincial adjective, descriptive of the atmospheric tumult to which its station is exposed in stormy weather. Pure bracing ventilator they must have up there at all times, indeed. One may guess the power of the north wind blowing over the edge, by the excessive slant of a few stunted firs at the end of the house, and by a range of gaunt thorns all stretching their limbs one way, as if craving alms of sun. So this is a very bleak picture which has been drawn by Lockwood of Woodring Heights. And his Woodring is, is a provincial adjective. It is, it is an adjective which you don't find in mainstream English language, it is adjective which is which is which is uh, peculiar to, uh, to this region where the story is set in this region uh, the house is located and this region is Yorkshire uh, and uh, and and so uh, in in Yorkshire accent and in Yorkshire dialect uh, Wuthering uh, refers to this very specific uh, phenomena. Of, of this uh, really unbearable weather and really cold, really wet, and something that can make something decay, right? Um, something that a kind of weather that can force things 
to decay and force plants to tilt, force thorns to hang out to kind of extend the thorns and extend, extend their arms in the family limbs uh, and making them appear as thorns are so big in sunlight. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and all of this creates a picture of desolation or creates a picture of something that is not going to be right later on in the novel. Uh, there is something that uh, is going to be very mister which will be exposed. And yet, despite knowing all this, despite making these statements from himself, yet we see Lockwood adamant on not only making friendship with Heathcliff, uh, and when he asks him to return the next day, he does return the next day. And he can promise the host, the host of Catherine Arndt, right? So he basically, he, he basically uh, calls upon himself the entire misfortune that, that of seeing the ghost of, of running away. All right, this this moment. It's the sound is like the comment. Is it breaking still? Not clear. Okay. Break. Uh, about I just refresh it and yeah yeah I'll just I'll just uh, uh, okay maybe I can uh, work with the cam I'll just refresh it. I just uh, someone send me a message if uh, I'm audible. All right. Okay. So, uh, am I audible now? I just uh, someone just confirm. Okay. All right. All right. Great. So many yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, as I was saying that, uh, what was I saying? I was saying something. Yeah, I was. I was talking about Lockwood. Yes. So. Uh, <clears throat> So Lockwood comes across as as uh, 
as someone who who has good judgment but he fails to act on his own judgment uh, and and we see that uh, there is there is something that uh, inside of him which which craves trouble that even though he is he is warned that uh, not to go there not to do this and not only by heathcliff but he wants uh, he wants himself that okay this does not feel right this, there's something uh, bad about this place but then he goes ahead and then only to encounter the ghost of catherine and be terrified out of his wits and this puts the novel into motion and then he returns and then he calls the housekeeper of thrushcross grange who is uh, a very interesting character uh, nelly dean uh, ellen dean is the name uh, she, uh, she is variously known as mrs dean and her nickname is nelly right and if you notice and from beginning to the end ellen dean is the one who has been present in all key moments of catherine and heathcliff uh, edgar linton and catherine um, catherine's husband uh, edgar is catherine's husband uh, then she is all also present during the birth uh, she is also present when 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 uh, hindley uh, catherine's brother uh, he comes with his bride and the bride gives birth to hareton she is also present when uh, isabella who was married to heathcliff she gives birth to linton and uh, linton is brought by uh, mr linton edgar linton uh, to thrushcross grange and then she is also present when linton is taken away by heathcliff and she is present at the time of hareton and cathy's blossoming friendship uh, she is present to see the fight which uh, breaks out at thrushcross grange among uh, catherine heathcliff edgar she is everywhere she is present everywhere and she and we we see that everyone has so much faith in nelly dean that they just tell nelly everything catherine goes to nelly and tells her that this is what i am thinking i i i, I won't marry edgar because i am i i will marry edgar not because i am in love with him but i will marry edgar for his money and his fame and his his position and everything uh heathcliff who is a particularly stubbornly reserved person heathcliff has no problem being candid with nelly right so heathcliff goes around telling nelly all the dark secrets that this is what i am going to accomplish this is what i am thinking that i will do this is what i am going to do and this is how i am going to make life hell for everyone right edgar uh, though he is the master of the house and he he does maintain some sort of reservation but we see that edgar also opens up to nelly dean from joseph to everyone from zilla uh, the other housekeeper at wuthering heights everyone opens up to nelly dean and nelly dean has that kind of quality and she is so mysterious we, uh, she is mrs dean but we never get to hear about her husband so where is mr dean we don't know where is mr dean right we don't see mr dean anywhere in the novel so <clears throat> and nelly dean is a fascinating character she she holds the strings of the narrative so well she is privy to every information that is happening at both the houses because she has worked at wuthering heights she has worked at thrushcross grange and later she goes back to wuthering heights right and just like everyone feels at ease telling nelly their secrets nelly feels at ease at telling everything to lockwood right and you will wonder that why is nelly telling lockwood all of these things because he has just arrived and yes it's okay i want to know about what is happening in that house but i will not tell the other person every minute little detail right now nelly dean is important nelly dean is a very important figure and she must be considered as a narrative tool she more than a character she is a narrative tool it is because of her that the story is progressing right if there was no nelly dean then we will not be aware of what 
of things that are going on in either Buttering Heights or Thrust Cross Branch, right? So Nelly Dean is instrumental in carrying the narrative forward. So, and, and this is the reason why we don't see about that, um, that we don't see Mr. Dean or we don't know the story of Nelly, right? Because Nelly is not meant to be articulated. Nelly is meant to be articulating, right? Nelly is not treated as a character in the novel. Nelly is a tool, a narrative tool, right? She moves the plot forward. She moves the story forward, right? So that's why we don't see Emily Bronte investing much in actually creating Nelly. That where does she come from? What is her story? How did, how did she end up at Woodring Heights? No, none of that. We just know that Nelly was there when uh, Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw used to live at Wuthering Heights. And then Nelly came with Catherine to Thrushcross Ranch. And then later Nelly went to Wuthering Heights to, uh, to tend to Cathy, right? And nothing apart from this. So does Nelly Dean have a son? Does Nelly Dean have a daughter? Uh, what happened to Mr. Dean? Where there is Nelly's family? Nothing, right? So Nelly is just used as a device in order to further the story. And Nelly is a fascinating device. It is, it is, it is like she is, she, she uh, like being a human being, and you will be so engrossed in the story that Nelly has to tell to Lockwood and Lockwood has to tell to us that we don't even pay attention to Nelly, right? because we are just so enchanted by the story that she is saying. And she is a wonderful storyteller. And she, she says, she tells the story with all animation and she tells the story with exact, uh, you know, replication of the emotions that this is how she said, this is how he said, this is what happened, this is how I felt. Uh, and I will, and I kid you not, uh, this is how I told Heathcliff, this is what I told Edgar. So it is a wonderful story that Nelly weaves, right, for Lockwood, and then Lockwood weaves. Uh, but uh, what we see here is that he, uh, is that usually we uh, we we see that there is first person. Uh, Wuthering Heights is a first person narrative, right, uh, because it begins with uh, Lockwood's uh, narration that I have come from this place. I, uh, from that, I have come to this place, from that place. So it is a first person narration, but uh, the narrative is, is is taken over by Nelly. Again, a first person narrative, right? So there is the principal primary uh, narrator who is Lockwood, and then there is the secondary narrator who is Nelly. And again, you have uh, the very confusion in what is primary and what is secondary, because the primary narrator does not narrate that much as much as the secondary narrator does. So Lockwood goes silent uh, after the first three chapters, and then Nelly takes over. And Lockwood just interjects in the middle just to make us aware that, OK, he is still there. This is something that George Eliot uh, uh, used to do in, in her, in her uh, novel, uh, The Mill on the Floss, where uh, she would go on and on uh, telling the story, and then suddenly she would uh, come back and she would uh, retract your attention that uh, that it is uh, it is her who is uh, saying the story and you must not mistake the story to be an omniscient narrative story <clears throat> so when we talk about narrative technique we see that it is it is not only and 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 it is easier for us to think that there are two narrators but even when nelly is narrating nelly being a secondary narrator herself even when she is narrating there come parts where she quotes verbatim. Like when Isabella comes to meet Nelly, and whatever happens between Nelly and Isabella, she quotes Isabella verbatim. And Isabella sends Nelly a letter also. So she quotes the letter verbatim in her narration, right? She does not summarize the letter, she quotes it, right? And and so what we have is that even though Nelly is is, is a secondary narrator. We have uh, we have channels through which tertiary narrators also crop up. So when Isabella has to tell her story, then Nelly gives that freedom, the entire freedom to Isabella to, yes, go ahead and say it. 
and nelly gives that freedom to isabella lockwood gives that freedom to nelly and lockwood by being invisible uh, makes us the readers uh, very much privy to the direct happenings at wuthering heights and thrushcross grange only appearing at strategic intervals to just remind us that no, no no he is still in control he is still lockwood you know lockwood who who is self deprecating but who still wants everything to be about himself so he he appears time and again and reminds us that no no, no i i am the narrator right now uh, let's move to uh, another chapter let's move to chapter 9 and and chapter 9 is uh, chapter 9 is chapter 9 is important yes because of the kitchen scene uh, in in this chapter what is happening in this chapter what happens is that catherine and edgar linton they have become friends and it is very clear that edgar would like to marry catherine because uh, he is besotted with her and catherine linton even though she loves uh, catherine earnshaw sorry even though she loves uh, heathcliff but heathcliff has been treated so badly by hindley and edgar and his value has been debased and demeaned to such a degree that that catherine cannot actually come to terms with herself marrying heathcliff and this is something that she articulates see uh, this is a short uh, very short uh, exchange between nelly dean and catherine because of course catherine has to tell nelly dean all the secrets so there are many things to be considered before that question can be answered properly i said sententially uh, i said i said uh, i said i said sententiously sorry i said sententiously this is nelly dean first and foremost do you love edgar this is what nelly is asking catherine that do you love edgar and the answer comes who can help it of course i do she answered catherine is answering then i put her through the following catechism for a girl of 22 it was not injudicious right now what happens is that suddenly the form of conversation is transformed into a form of interview and you'll see this why do you love him miss cathy nonsense i do that sufficient by all means you must say why well because he is handsome and pleasant to be with bad was my commentary this is nelly and because he is young and cheerful bad still and because he loves me indifferent coming there and he will be rich and i shall like to be the greatest woman of the neighborhood and i shall be proud of having such a husband worst of all and now say how you love love him as every uh, and then uh, catherine says as everybody loves you are silly nelly and then nelly says not at all answer me that why and how you love uh, how you love him and then uh, catherine says i love the ground under his feet and the air over his head and everything he touches and every word he says i love all his looks and all his actions and him entirely and all together there now and then nelly says and why and then catherine says nay you are making a jest of it it is exceedingly ill natured it is no jest to me said the young lady scowling and turning her face to the fire right and then and then uh, nelly dean says that i am far from jesting miss catherine you love mr edgar because he is handsome and young and cheerful and rich and loves you the last however goes for nothing you would love him without that probably and with it you wouldn't unless he possessed the first the former four attractions and then uh, catherine says that no no to be sure not i should only pity him hate him perhaps if he were rich and all of those uh, socially acceptable things but he were ugly and a clown right and then and then and then uh, a few pages down uh, uh, she uh, she says finally she says that i have no more business to marry edgar linton than i have to be in heaven and if the wicked man in there had not brought heathcliff so low i shouldn't have thought of it it would degrade me to marry heathcliff now 
so he shall never know how i love him and that not because he is handsome nelly but because he is more myself than i am whatever our souls are made of his and mine are the same and lintons is as different as a moonbeam from lightning or frost from fire right and before i come to explain this uh, just in the next paragraph uh, nelly dean says that he had listened heathcliff he had listened till he heard catherine say it would degrade her to marry him and then he stayed to hear no further so what happened now is that nelly dean and uh, catherine are talking nelly dean asks catherine that why do you want to marry uh, edgar and do you love edgar and catherine says yeah, yeah i do love edgar i love everything about him and catherine throughout the novel has been wishy washy uh, she uh, and this is one of the uh, one of the drawbacks of being wild right that uh, you can't you can't reason with wildness you can't reason with wildness and you can't you can't make wildness stick to its word right so if catherine is wild then let her let her be wild so she will display this she she will display she will display uh, uh, this kind of uh, wild attribute uh, ghanista i've got your question i'll just uh, uh, i'll just i'll just uh, come to it later okay yeah <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and and then uh, and then uh, nelly tries to uh, force a kind of confession from catherine that uh, what uh, what do you like about edgar and after much 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 uh, uh, persuasion uh, catherine finally uh, admits that uh, edgar is very different from edgar is very different from catherine and heathcliff is very similar to catherine and actually catherine goes on to say that heathcliff is is more me than he himself is now in in our millennial lingo okay in 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 uh, relationships which are like this where you need the person you don't want the person but you need the person right it's called codependency right and this is not healthy uh, when when you think that someone is more you than you yourself are then it means that you you perhaps are not even confident of yourself and that perhaps you project too much of yourself onto someone else uh, edgar linton has all the fine qualities uh, but but catherine is not attracted to edgar because he is is charming and he is he is handsome but catherine is attracted to edgar because of practical reasons and because of practical reasons because of money because of fortune because of status right and catherine even though he she she feels codependent a kind of codependent love uh, for uh, heathcliff what we see is that uh, she still will not marry heathcliff because heathcliff has been you know like he he has been degraded to a very low level by god and by all the things that have happened in his life so it won't suit uh, catherine to actually marry heathcliff and what it creates is is the very principal misunderstanding and heathcliff did not wait to hear the rest of catherine's proclamations about her love for heathcliff he only heard that uh, she will not marry him right and then heathcliff disappears for 3 years and god knows what he did in those 3 years meanwhile catherine gets married to edgar it is a loveless kind of a marriage catherine does not love edgar edgar is is head over heels in love with catherine but uh, his affections are not returned by her uh, catherine to be honest she, she and sometimes you will also feel that catherine proves to be a very bad wife i mean it's it's one thing to love someone it's another to love someone while being married to someone else whom you have said that you also love but not loving him after the marriage and being uh, uh, and and just being saucy just being uh, 
very cruel with words uh, and and edgar a uh, poor fellow he 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 tries to win over uh, his own wife he tries to win the heart of his own wife and 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 he tries to do it so much that in the end uh, even though catherine dies and catherine dies because uh, yes uh, she, uh, she is in a tumult and she uh, she is frightened and she uh, she is suffering from the confusion and then she is not eating she is starving herself but catherine takes delight in that and this is this is problematic because catherine takes delight in starving herself to uh, sickness so that that will a uh, kind of frighten edgar and at one at one point she says that i want to frighten him so the kind of love that catherine has for edgar if if that is love if, if that is anything right so what catherine has for edgar is just a a form of like uh, a contempt like yeah i i don't really care about you i but i would like to torture you and the love that catherine has for heathcliff is again something very uh, very cruel it is it is not healthy it is toxic like when people say toxic relationship i would say just yes catherine and heathcliff are toxic relationship just as catherine and edgar linton were in a toxic relationship right because no one is happy here edgar is not happy catherine is not happy heathcliff is never happy so 3 years later heathcliff returns and he just returns and uh, he just returns to cause trouble and when he returns there is there is a fight breaks out between heathcliff and edgar linton and where heathcliff while being in edgar's place while being in thrushcross branch uh, he insults edgar he insults catherine for marrying edgar and he and and catherine insults uh, edgar her own husband for not being uh, for not being uh, physically strong like heathcliff what happens that even though heathcliff tries to intimidate edgar edgar is courageous enough to fight for himself and he stands up from his chair he punches uh, he, he blows one knock uh, to heathcliff makes heathcliff choke and then rushes out to get reinforcement right so if we are thinking of wuthering heights as a love story then we need to reconsider what kind of love is this a love that is violent which makes nobody happy which only makes a person seek revenge only makes a person uh, take happiness in other person suffering i mean this is what catherine is doing to edgar and this is what heathcliff is doing Uh, to Catherine and Edgar, and even after Catherine's death, and even after Edgar's death, Heathcliff will continue to do it with Catherine's daughter, Cathy. Now, when when we move towards uh, towards the uh, towards the narrative, uh, what happens with Nelly Dean is that uh, when Catherine dies, and there's something that we need to uh, that we need to. uh look more uh, into that when catherine dies uh heathcliff puts a lock of his hair in the locket that she was wearing right and there was a lock of uh catherine's hair also i don't have any hair so sorry i i just keep referring to my bald head uh so uh, there is a lock of catherine's hair and there is a lock of heathcliff's hair and it is nelly dean who actually twist these two locks together symbolically uniting heathcliff and catherine right and then heathcliff bribes the and heathcliff tells nelly that when he dies then he has to be laid next to catherine right and this is what happens that in the end when heathcliff does die then catherine is in the middle there is edgar on one side and there is heathcliff's grave on the other right and even in death you would uh, you would think that okay perhaps in death they would be happily ever after but no even in death it is a love triangle even in death there is edgar catherine and heathcliff right so what sort of a love story is this 
when I was first told about Wuthering Heights, a professor had told me about it. And he had said that this is going to be a raunchy love story, right? So I started reading Wuthering Heights as, as a 19-year-old kid, thinking that it would be a very hot and steamy novel. And in the second chapter, I saw uh, Lockwood being terrified by uh, the ghost. And then I realized that, no, 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 this is not something that I had in mind when I when when I thought that it is going to be a raunchy novel. But it is only so many years later, it's only almost 10 years later that now I understand that, yes, it is a raunchy novel. It is, it, it, it is a novel that is going to mess with you. It is a novel that is going to make you question that whatever you have thought about love, it, it, it just turns it upside down. Near the end of the novel, right? And, and this is where I will uh, finish the analysis of the text. Near the end of the novel, what you will see is that uh, Hareton Earnshaw, who is the son of Hindley, uh, Catherine's brother. Hareton Earnshaw, uh, he is raised by Heathcliff in his own image, right? Uh, even though Hareton Earnshaw is the last uh, living descendant of the Earnshaw uh, family, and he is by his title very respected. But uh, Heathcliff has managed to, uh, to keep him an illiterate, keep him uncultivated, keep him ill-mannered, right? Because uh, Hareton reminds Heathcliff of Henley who used to mistreat Heathcliff. And then there is Heathcliff's own son, which he had with Isabella, Edgar Linton's sister, right? And Heathcliff's own son is very much like Edgar. So a person whom Heathcliff abhorred, right? A person who ended up marrying Catherine, a person whom Heathcliff considered weak, uh, not man enough, right? Uh, Heathcliff's own son, uh, he has returned, uh, carrying the image of the Linton and not the Heathcliff, and not Heathcliff. And meanwhile, uh, the son of Hindley, who is who is the Earnshaw family, he has been forcefully uh, been turned into Heathcliff Junior, almost. So when we talk about turning of the wheel of fortune, when we talk about karma, so this is this is a karma in, in a very weird way that uh, Heathcliff was so abhorrent, uh, Heathcliff was so uh, disdainful towards, towards uh, Edgar that his own son turned out to be even weaker than Edgar. His own son, uh, Linton Heathcliff, uh, he can't even uh, go out in the garden to take a walk with uh, little Kathy, who, who clearly expresses her desire to take a walk in the garden. And he is so weak, and he is so physically weak, right? Not, not emotionally weak, but so physically weak that he can't move 10 steps without falling sick. And then uh, the marriage between Linton Heathcliff and Kathy uh, Linton, that happens under forced circumstances engineered by Heathcliff. And, and the only thing that Linton does is that, uh, and, and, and Linton, Linton basically breaks down in front of Cathy uh, uh, and says that uh, my father is going to uh, uh, kill me if, if uh, I told you uh, that uh, this is, these are the plans. My father, uh, I am very scared of my father. Oh, please save me, please save me, please save me, right? This is something that even Edgar did not do, but Heathcliff's own son is doing, right? So Heathcliff had all the reasons to despise his own son and, and uh, all the reasons to, I, I don't think that Heathcliff is capable of liking someone, but he did, he did felt resonance towards Hin, uh, Hindley's son, uh, Hareton Unshaw, uh, whom he had managed to spoil, whom he had, uh, uh, whom he had not given any education and uh, he had he had not given any manners. So uh, Hareton turned out to be just as brute, just as a rough uh, 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 person without uh, any uh, 
without any awareness that how to behave in front of a lady, how to behave in front of someone who is uh, who is from Victorian upper class, and 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 this this uh, and and finally uh, to to close the entire novel, what happens that Heathcliff does get Heathcliff, even though he gets all his revenge, he manages to get the ownership of Wuthering Heights. He manages to get the ownership of Thrush Cross Branch. Uh, he manages to ruin the lives of everyone uh, who is around him. But there is one thing which Cathy had told Heathcliff, and that was that no one will love you. No one will miss you when you are dead. No one will cry after you, right? And despite all the engineering, despite everything, despite his immense dislike towards Cathy, despite his immense dislike towards his own son, who ends up dying, uh, it, despite his immense dislike towards Hilton, after all this thing, love does triumph. So this book is not really a, a very sad, sad book about sad, sad love, but love does triumph. And love triumphs between young Cathy and Hareton Earnshaw, right? When Hareton Earnshaw, who was ridiculed by young Cathy uh, for being an illiterate, for being ill-mannered, right? And 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 Catherine and Heathcliff, when they were young, they were very fond of each other, and they did not meet in their lifetimes. They were very fond of each other. They were very. Uh, uh, Catherine would never make fun of Heathcliff, but Catherine understood Heathcliff, right? Because according to Catherine, he was more Catherine than he himself was. And look where it got them. And uh, young Cathy, who used to make fun of uh, Hareton before, and Hareton, who used to and 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 uh, who used to look at uh, young Cathy with some sort of uh, resentment also and with some sort of reservation. But later, gradually, these two started warming up to each other, right? And when Lockwood returns, what does he hear? The very first thing that he hears is that Hareton Earnshaw trying to pronounce the word contrary, right? And this word is very important, contrary, right? Because uh, we see that everything that uh, happens in Wuthering Heights, it, it, is, it is contradictory, it is it is. Uh, it is something that 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 goes contrary to what we feel, that contrary to what we come to read a book like Wuthering Heights with our own presuppositions, with our own assumptions that what a love story is supposed to be, what tragedy is supposed to be, what uh, a gothic novel is supposed to be. Contrary to all of these, we have this book called Wuthering Heights, right? Which, which, which. Uh, at at one time, it uh, reaffirms the stereotype, it reaffirms the archetypes, and at the same time, it dismantles the archetypes too, right? And in the end, what we see is that despite Heathcliff's uh, so much drama that he has done throughout the book, and what we see is that uh, in the end, uh, love does blossom in Wuthering Heights, and the formerly inaccessible moors where people were prone to getting lost, people were prone to losing the way, people were prone to just die, right, if you lost your way. And previously the moors were hostile. Now the same moors are the place where young Cathy and Hareton are going to take box, right? So with the change in emotions in the novel, with the change in mental space among the characters in the novel, we see that there is a transformation of the landscape too. The landscape also changes from hostile to a friendly, congenial, inviting place where love can blossom, right? So that's it. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming and listening to my talk. Uh, I have one question from uh, Ghanishtha. And Ganista says that, sir, wouldn't it be right to consider Nelly Dean as the most manipulating and scheming character of the novel? It is, uh, it is she who informs us that Catherine is self-centered and Heathcliff is kind of savage. For no good reason, everything comes to Nelly to discuss their personal lives and thoughts, and she sabotages trust of other people, yes. And even after knowing that, Heathcliff is listening everything Catherine is confessing, 
she does not try to stop her can we really rely on nelly as a narrator that is a very good question of course we can't rely on nelly as a narrator uh, because yes uh, nelly uh, actually manipulates uh, little kathy also that uh, please don't tell your father that i have brought you to this place and there are various instances of manipulation there are various instances of manipulation on uh, nelly's parts okay it's just not one it's just not to with uh, uh, kathy uh, with catherine and and you know sometimes uh, the way she like uh, first time when nelly is introduced to cat uh, to heathcliff the um, the pronoun that she uses for him is it it is not him he no i washed it i fed it i clothed it right so the very first pronoun that nelly used for heathcliff was not a pronoun that we use for human beings it was the pronoun that we usually use for object for animals right and that Uh, perhaps has never left her and for nelly heathcliff is always negative the thing is that it is our responsibility to try to find loopholes in nelly's narration but to what extent will you try and find loopholes to what extent will you try to create an alternative narrative for yourself uh, because in the end uh, we are at the mercy of nelly dean so it, as as students of literature as someone who uh, who who reads fiction critically we 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 must say that yes there are instances where nelly dean cannot be relied upon and yes there are instances where uh, and and uh, what how much can you tell by a look i mean nelly dean says that uh, in most of the time uh, she is like heathcliff had a dark look about him heathcliff had a devilish look about him uh, yes you're right that uh, whatever impressions that we get of heathcliff we get from nelly and whatever impressions that we get of catherine that also we get from nelly so from nelly's point of view both catherine and heathcliff right so catherine is always wild and and not uh, conforming right to the ideals of the victorian society and how the victorian society would like uh their women to be uh meanwhile heathcliff is definitely the other to the society heathcliff is not even considered uh, a part of the society so there is a strong morality at play uh, in nelly in nelly's mind and and you will see that morality shifting because she is very uh, tolerant towards the younger kathy who is meek and who is uh, who despite even though she has Uh, inherited uh, uh, catherine's uh, sauciness uh, that sharp tongue but still uh, younger kathy is 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 more pliable she is she is she is more like she she is more affectionate towards uh, her father she is more affectionate towards uh, her cousin uh, hertan uh, the, the former catherine the catherine senior the mother catherine she was never uh, shown to be affectionate towards anyone right she was always thrashing someone or the other so he is a bad fellow he is a bad fellow this that this that everywhere uh, yagya k has a question all right uh, surbhi has a question first in the novel significant tumultuous events are accompanied by storms and help to signify the raging emotions of the character in a way we notice whether can be calm or violent just like character what kind of connection do we infer between the weather and the mood of the characters well just like you said that uh, uh, weather and the mood of characters are often seen to be complementing each other right and and and, and something that uh, something something that uh, we something that that uh, uh, something that we uh, i'm sorry i was just looking at the other question also so what kind of connection do we infer between weather and the mood of the character okay so now think about it. if it wasn't the moors if it, if it was just a river between wuthering heights and and thrush cross grounds like you wouldn't have all these kind of dangers accompanying you you wouldn't uh, have all these kinds of like and and what happens is that when uh, when it is it's a wind swept moor right it's a wind swept moor and and 
so when the storm comes it is it, it will rage right and it will rage and it will be uh, and what emily bronte does is that she she uses this uh, landscape and she uses uh, the weather and she uses uh, the very word wuthering of which she has explained before through lockwood that what happens here is that things are prone to decay right and while we we think that uh, every time the storm is raging then something must something bad will happen uh, with people and and many times it is a convenient trope to use because uh, we can uh, draw a direct uh, line uh, that yes uh, it is a uh, raging storm will equal to raging emotions uh, but uh, i would still consider uh, that uh, to uh, to be a rather too simplistic and something that we shouldn't do often uh, yes there is relationship uh, between the weather and the landscape and the characters among these three uh, elements um, but uh, but but at the same time uh, it will be reductive on our part to reduce everything to just the weather right so yes bronte does uh, hint at uh, these parallels Br bronte does actually uh, articulate these parallels also in in uh, like say for example when lockwood is trapped in that room and it is howling winds outside and the windows are shuttering up and down and he has to go and close the windows for the ghost of catherine to take hold of his wrist so like with nelly dean the storm is also a narrative tool so that if the storm is there then you are going to uh, then then only you are going to shut the window and then only the ghost of catherine is going to hold on to your wrist all right uh uh yeah uh, 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 dealing with wuthering heights as a psychological fiction can you tell us anything about the archetypal characters well archetypal there are many archetypal uh, there are uh, many archetypal characters so you have and and it, it is like uh, in in terms of uh, psychoanalysis and uh, archetypes if if we, if we think about uh, how uh, the jungian archetypes uh, then <clears throat> there's there's uh, there's like you have uh, the, the conflict with the self the conflict with the society you have the conflict that you have to emerge from it uh, there are various there are various i i i think that uh, like say for example that but not not going into the uh, the jungian archetypes so much but uh, just uh, uh, dealing with it uh, in general uh, we will see that uh, uh, say for example there is there is uh, there is the archetype of the hero right so the gothic hero and the gothic hero is supposed to be your tall dark and handsome person and who 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 will come and rescue the damsel in distress and the damsel will be shrieking and, and the damsel will be in in trouble right here uh, the gothic hero is tall dark and but not handsome and uh, the gothic hero will not save the damsel in distress that is the point because an gothic hero will actually put the damsel in the bunker uh, just like uh, heathcliff does with young cathy Uh, similarly uh, say for example you have you have you have the uh, you have you have the character of joseph right and and joseph is present as as a constant reminder that uh, he uh, of of god right of, because joseph's weapon is the bible and he uses the verses of bible to to create this very oppressive kind of uh, an environment where Uh, where even though he is using positive meanings he is using uh, words from something as positive as as the bible uh, what what it ends up doing is is that it ends up just uh, feeding uh, into the negativity of the entire uh, the entire house and you have joseph as someone who is standing tall and looking down upon people and like you have to do this you have to do that you will be damned Uh, maybe say that all the characters in the novel are deceased either psychologically and or physically yes you can uh, it is it is a deeply troubling uh, novel because uh, it, like uh, we have come to understand that uh, like i said that the love relationship uh, what what is uh, what is uh, what is projected in this novel as as something which is uh, a love story but that love story is very toxic that love story is is not healthy 
right? So there, there is, and and we have people who are codependent on each other, just like uh, uh, Heathcliff and Catherine are codependent on each other, and so much so that they can't, uh, they can't seem to find happiness, and they can't seem to find happiness on their own. They have to find happiness or sadness with each other. So this is obsession. This is this is extreme level obsession, and this is not at all healthy. And this is this is a disorder. Yes, this will be a disorder. And then uh, when you say that uh, they are diseased physically, well, uh, in 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 case of uh, sometimes there are overlappings. Sometimes there are overlappings because uh, what uh, in terms of Catherine, what has led to her disease is that she 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 has been trying to harm Edgar. And she has been trying to attract attention towards her so much that she refuses to eat and ends up getting and diseased and physically diseased, right? And with uh, in case of uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, Linton Heathcliff, a very weak child, uh, and and all of these weaknesses and all of these physical or psychological weaknesses, they combine together to create this mood that nothing good is going to happen, right? And this mood will linger with you till like chapter 32, 33, only in the last chapter that when Lockwood returns, last few chapters that when Lockwood returns uh, and to Wuthering Heights that you see one glimmering hope that yes, perhaps with the demise of Heathcliff, perhaps with the demise of Catherine and the demise of all these characters whom we have dealt with before. So the Edgar Linton, Linton is dead. All the diseased characters are dead, right? So the, demise, uh, the demise of all the diseased characters, we have these two people who are finally taking charge of their own lives, right? Uh, there you have younger Cathy and you have Hareton, right? last straw of two families, uh, Earnshaw family and Linton family, right? They're finally taking charge in a healthy manner. They're not taking charge of their life in a codependent manner in which previously people were. Like even for all the goodness that Edgar embodies in himself, and even then uh, Edgar ha is, is dependent on Cathy, uh, on Catherine, right? Edgar. Edgar has to be there for Catherine, even though Catherine treats him poorly, even though Catherine rebukes him, insults him, then also Edgar keeps coming to her like a faithful dog, right? And this is something that we presently acknowledge and recognize that this is not healthy. Uh, these, are, these, are all, uh, uh, these are all problematic uh, aspects in any kind of relationship. No relationship should be like this, and let alone any relationship should be romanticized uh, in this manner, because this is only going to harm the people involved. Okay. Uh, is a genre defined? Uh, okay. Uh, so, so in the novel, we get that descendants are continuing the type of love and marriage, but they didn't carry the type of revenge as he did. What are your concerns for this? Okay, I'll come to this. Uh, Jindagi. Uh, and you highlight that uh, W. Uh, Heights is a genre-defying novel, does not conform to a particular type of fiction and combines their own. The whole scheme is contrary to, uh, the whole scheme is contrary to prevalent novelistic archetypes. Yes, exactly, it is contrary to prevalent no uh, novelistic archetypes. So first I'll, I'll come to uh, Noshaba. Uh, uh, sir, in the novel, we get that descendants are continuing the type of love and marriage. Uh, see. Uh, when they are continuing love, right? Uh, are they also continuing marriage? Uh, well, uh, she was forced to marry uh, young Cathy. She was forced to marry uh, Heathcliff, uh, the son of Heathcliff, uh, which is Linton Heathcliff. Uh, but later, uh, when Heathcliff is dead, the senior Heathcliff is dead, when everyone is dead, what, what is happening is that finally, with no baggage around, with no baggage of people around. They finally have uh, Hareton and Cathy. They finally have time to actually think of their own, right? Because Hareton has never thought of his own. He was always ordered by Heathcliff. And similarly, Cathy, even though she used to think of her own before, but still she, she was always under the shadow of Edgar. She was under the shadow of Nellie Dean. And 
the moment she entered uh, Budring Heights and from the very first encounter that she has with the building, uh, she uh, she has in some ways or the other and more so in the later chapters, oppressively controlled by what Heathcliff has to say and how Heathcliff has to, uh, how Heathcliff wants things done. And uh, so they did not carry the revenge like Heathcliff did because they did not approach the love in the way Heathcliff and Catherine approached the love for each other. Uh, finally, after Heathcliff's death, after Catherine's death, after everyone's death, they finally come to their senses. They finally have begun to enjoy life as it was given to them. And finally thinking on their own and not, not bothered by what other people have to say, not bothered that there is a shadow over looming uh, over there, just looming over these two people and asking them to behave in a certain way. And when there is, there is nothing, there is no controlling force they, they choose to behave in a cordial manner. They choose to behave in a friendly manner and in a loving manner. And that is redemption in the novel. Uh, Jindagi, yes, of course, it is a genre-defying novel and it does not uh, conform to a particular type of fiction. Whether it is gothic, uh, revenge, love story, yes, the, the whole scheme is contrary to prevalent novelistic archetypes. So uh, we, we saw that uh, uh, the gothic archetype has been undermined uh, the rags to riches story, even though uh, we, we, when we think of a rags to riches story, we don't just mean that material rags to uh, material riches story. We also mean that emotional rags to emotional riches story. And that is the kind of fiction that we, we enjoy, that uh, when, uh, when a poor person finally gets to acquire wealth, then that person not only acquires wealth, but also emotional wealth. And here Heathcliff appears to have acquired only wealth and not the emotional maturity or not the emotional acceptance that should have come with uh, that should have come come with experience he is still harping on that that uh, that initial misunderstanding that was just it it was all uh, a result of one misunderstanding that he himself did not uh, sit in long enough to hear catherine out and that one uh, pinch which uh, which actually he took to his uh, to his ego and that pinch has created such a mess throughout the novel uh, and it is it is unreal and but uh, some uh, whenever i whenever i read uh, the novel I, I i i can't help but admire emily bronte uh, that uh, writing at uh, the peak of victorian england and dealing with characters like these and 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 no no wonder uh, she she wrote under a pseudonym. Of course, she had to write under a pseudonym. Like who wouldn't? Uh, and but still, there is so much originality in in uh, in the novel that every time that I personally read the novel, I find something uh, new to look forward to. And uh, and it is a raunchy uh, story. I'm not sure whether it is a raunchy love story, but it is a raunchy story. It it is something that it is a haunting story. Uh, so uh, thank you very, very much uh, for having me. And uh, I just went on rambling for, I think, uh, close to two hours now. Uh, and I, I hope that I made sense. Well, you did, Mihir. Thank you very, very much for this cozy session for a not very cozy text. <laughs> Thanks a lot for sharing with us the growth of a reader, growth as a reader, through your personal experience. I think this session is going to help a lot to our students. Thank you very much for always being ready to you know, join the students of Guru Nanak College. It feels really, really good. And we wish to have your presence more and more. So uh, thank you, Mihir, for your time, your patience. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, the students, friends, Many fans of Mihir, I saw them, you know, they had joined. So thank you, everybody, <laughs> for joining us here with uh, today's session. Um, take care. Have a great time ahead. Mihir, uh, you can check out the chat box before you leave. There are many good wishes for you. So, <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you, thank everybody. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks. Thanks.